The second section is set on the seas during the crossing from uh, Calcutta to the Caribbean. And it's based on my analysis of 77 indenture voyages uh, to British Guyana. Whenever a ship docked, the chief immigration agent at its destination had to report on its passage from India. Some of these dispatches, including the one detailing my great-grandmother's voyage, have been destroyed. Those that survive pull back the screen, if only for brief moments and partial views, on the lives of the women aboard. It is hard in these glimpses to escape the angle of sexual exploitation by figures of all ranks and races. In these archives of misconduct, the women appear resisting advances or giving in to them, or in the eyes of many ship officials, hoarding them. But the records also provide other views of the women on deathbeds, giving birth, losing children, going mad, being driven to suicide, engaged in infanticide, rejecting or being rejected by shipboard husbands demanding that husbands prove themselves, stowing away, crying, cursing, possibly in love, and clearly in anguish. I cannot imagine that the journey was anything but a saga, even for immigrants whose lives aboard passed relatively without incident. Seasickness afflicted most. A majority fell ill with mumps, measles, dysentery, hookworm, or fever. The ache for home was so sharp that one ship surgeon declared, I know that many die from nostalgia, pure and simple. The excitement of the newness of everything keeps them up for a time, but soon dies away and is followed by depression when they realize what they have done. The realization must have dawned slowly as the sea lengthened and the conditions aboard affected them one by one, as blankets rough as jute, sometimes rotten and foul-smelling, caused pus to form on children as the fans for circulating air were shut down at night when most needed, as the condenser to make the water potable broke, which it routinely did, and as the floor beneath them sweated. All the while, surgeons prepared their balance sheets of births and deaths, recording Shiva's unending dance without realizing it. The Hindu god who destroys in order to create who dances in a ring of flames to maintain the universe's ceaseless cycle of creation and destruction, did not forget the cargo hold. I'm referring to something far more metaphysical than birth or mortality rates. Here a woman born on a ship to the West Indies in 1888. On that mad ocean, when all was tossing, people's heads were spinning, and then labor pains started for Ma to have her child. On that mad ocean I was born, on that mad ocean I came to life. She was describing her own origins, but with her incantatory words, she could have been telling the creation story of our people, mine and hers. She could have continued in her voice of myth. In our beginning, there was a boat. On that mad ocean, we came to life. We passed the Black Sea to reach the Red. The water was blue before it was green, and then it was mud. We crossed seven seas, seven shades of water, shades of darkness and light, light that died and darkness that was born, darkness somehow extinguished and light rekindled. The captain's wheel became Shiva's fiery circle, turning and turning in its cosmic spiral. And in the gyrating of the gales and the churning of the waves, as one seared and the other danced, we became new. The moorings of caste had loosened, and people who had left behind uncles, sisters, husbands, and mothers substituted shipmates, their jihajis, for kin. Unraveled, they began, ever so slowly, to spin the threads of a novel identity. Indenture ships were not slave ships, but there can be no denying a few ties that should have bound the three million Africans trafficked by the British as slaves and the million Indians transported as coolies. The people in the hold in both cases were cut from the same demographic, mainly young and overwhelmingly male. Women were in short supply and subject to sexual exploitation during both crossings. And both journeys were transformative, signaling a break with the past, 
making whatever came before it seem almost as unimaginable to later generations as time and space before the Big Bang. In the beginning, there was a boat. Having emerged from its belly, as survivors, the indentured Indians could no longer be who they had been. Like the slaves before them, they were an entirely new people, forged by suffering, created through destruction. In this sense, above all else, theirs was a middle passage marked by brutal reinvention. How do I even begin to situate my great-grandmother in this odyssey? If I draw an imaginary line from moment to moment on the ships, from glimpse to glimpse of women aboard, will her shape emerge, constellation-like? Could the wrong shape emerge if I connect the wrong moments to each other? How do I know which are right? Will her constellation give off light?